Good afternoon, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you for this IINA a webinar this afternoon. And we're particularly delighted to be joined by Mr. David Helvey, who is the Deputy Representative in Europe for the US Secretary of Defense and also the Deputy Defense Advisor to the US mission to NATO. Uh, he will speak to us on defending Europe, uh, American perspectives on the Madrid summit and NATO's new strategic concept. Uh, just a few of the rules for the webinar today. Um, Mr. Helvey will speak for about 20 minutes and then we will proceed to question and answers with our audience. Uh, you will be able to join uh, using the Q&A function on Zoom, which you should see on your screen. And please feel free to send your questions in in the course of the session as they occur to you. And we will come to them to as many as we possibly can when Mr. Helvey has finished his presentation. Uh, just a short background to today's talk. Uh, at the NATO summit in Madrid on the 28th, 29th of June uh, last week, uh, politicians and officials met in what has been the largest defense meeting since the Second World War. NATO's new strategic concept was released and it assesses the threat environment and orientates the alliance to meet the challenges posed by the present security landscape. It's a very different security document to that which was released 10 years ago. Then Russia was a partner and China did not feature as a security threat. Now Russia is assessed as the most significant threat to allied security and stability in the Euro-Atlantic area. Uh, and in strong terms, uh, the concept highlights uh, that China poses a threat to the interest, security and values of the rules-based international order. The concept also deals with climate change as another threat. So the US, of course, is crucial to NATO and for uh, the future of European security. And that's why it's very important for us to hear the views of Mr. Helby today. So that allows me to formally introduce Mr. Helby. Uh, as I mentioned, he is Deputy Representative in Europe for the US Secretary of Defense and also uh, the Deputy Defense Advisor to the US Mission to NATO. Uh, he is responsible for planning, uh, recommending, coordinating and monitoring US Department of Defense policies, programs and initiatives in Europe, as well as the formulation and presentation of Department of Defense policies uh, to the US ambassador to NATO, uh, Ambassador Julianne Smith. Um, before his present, taking up his present post in November, 2021, Mr. Helvey has had a long and distinguished career and background in Indo-Pacific security affairs. Uh, he served as Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific Security Affairs, where he was responsible for overseeing the execution of the United States uh, defense and security policy in the Indo-Pacific region. Uh, there are a number of other um, uh, details and CVs, but just let me mention he's been awarded a number of honors. Uh, and it's well worth mentioning the honors, uh, including the Presidential Rank Award of Meritorious Executive, the Department of Defense Distinguished Civilian Service Medal, and the Secretary of Defense uh, Meritorious Civilian Service Medal. I think that's a good point to uh, hand over, Mr. Helvey, uh, to you to speak to us on this topic, uh, which we really are anxious to hear uh, because it affects us all. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Cross, for that uh, very kind introduction. And thank you to uh, all of the group online for joining. Uh, and thank you in particular to the Institute for Internet, uh, uh, Institute of International and European Affairs uh, for providing this, uh, this forum, for having this discussion. I think this is a great initiative and the timing is absolutely impeccable. You know, we've all struggled through this pandemic, but one of the things that I think stands out as a silver lining, if there is one, is our discovery uh, and use of tools and technology to bridge distances and enhance connection and to blend the physical and the virtual in a way that allows us to be in more than one place at, at, at a time. Although I do truly wish that I could be in Ireland uh, to be able to do this type of thing in person um, instead of here in Brussels, 
I think the weather here is fine, and I'm certainly uh, pleased to be able to, uh, to, to, to be with you today. Um, this is a good opportunity, uh, as the ambassador said, uh, to provide an update on what's been going on here uh, at NATO, uh, and in particular in light of the, uh, the Madrid summit that we had last week, uh, and what all of this means uh, for US security as well as European security. You know, there have been many adjectives used to describe uh, this summit, but I'll use three. You know, it was truly significant. Uh, it was truly historic, uh, and it was truly transformational. Uh, first, in terms of the significant, uh, we knew uh, long before people started arriving in Madrid that the summit would be significant. Taking our taskings from the, the last summit that we had for NATO in Brussels in uh, 2021, uh, where we were told that we had to develop a new strategic concept to better reflect the changed security environment and to set guidelines for the alliance going forward. That was going to be a pretty heavy lift to begin with. We saw opportunity uh, to improve uh, relations between NATO and the European Union with our development of a strategic uh, concept in parallel with work that was going on on the other side of Brussels uh, to develop uh, the European Union's uh, strategic compass. So again, there's real opportunity there uh, to develop greater alignment uh, between these two uh, great institutions. We also took on the task of carrying forward uh, and resourcing the ambition uh, that was laid out for the Alliance in the NATO 2030 agenda, looking both at the present and the long-term implications of a whole raft of issues, whether it's emerging and disruptive technology, uh, cyber space, uh, energy, climate, uh, women, peace, and security, and something that's near and dear to my heart, uh, the Indo-Pacific. So no doubt we knew uh, going into this that this would be a pretty heavy lift uh, to prepare for the summit. Uh, then, as we all know, uh, February 24th happened. Ma major war uh, returned to Europe uh, in, May in ways that, that many thought impossible, even up until uh, the 23rd of February. Uh, but what we're witnessing now is the greatest challenge uh, to the pillars of Euro-Atlantic security that we've seen in seven decades. So again, this forms part of the backdrop uh, to the preparations for this summit. This crisis uh, drove much of what the Alliance had on its agenda through the fall and became truly its overarching focus. Uh, how to respond and respond to this crisis we did. Uh, we did in a unified, coherent, and effective way. I mean, the first thing that we focused on was how to reinforce the Eastern flank. This was the task and the guidance that was given to us, not only by our president, but by the presidents and the uh, prime ministers, the heads of state and government of the alliance. We activated plans and mobilized the NATO response force uh, for the very first time. We employed crisis response measures to give the NATO military authorities the tools and the resources that they needed to deter escalation and to defend all allies. Indeed, many of the adaptations that NATO had developed following the 2014 crisis and the seizure of Crimea uh, and, the, and the, the work in the Donbass, uh, many of these adaptations that we created just on paper, we were able to put into practice very swiftly uh, following the launch of this invasion. As an alliance, I think we demonstrated strength and speed uh, to significantly enhance our posture on the Eastern flank. We expanded uh, very quickly, the number of battle groups from four to eight, and we now had a total of 170,000 uh, forces uh, in the East, along with uh, 40,000 of them operating under NATO command and control today. And for the United States part, uh, we very quickly added some additional 20,000 troops to Europe, uh, bringing, to a, uh, bringing our total uh, in the European area of responsibility up to over 100,000. The president uh, at Madrid also made a number of significant announcements, including uh, the uh, permanent stationing of the Fifth Corps headquarters in Poland, uh, a commitment to maintain an additional uh, rotational brigade combat team in Europe with its headquarters in Romania, uh, enhancing rotational deployments in the Baltics, maintaining a truly combat credible heel to toe presence along with our other allies and the host country forces there uh, to ensure that we've got a strong defense uh, forward. Uh, the president also announced he was sending additional fifth generation fighters to the United Kingdom and additional uh, destroyers uh, to Spain, uh, bringing the total from four uh, to six. 
Second, following the uh, following the, the launch of the invasion, allies were determined to help Ukraine defend itself. As NATO, as an institution, NATO has been focused on speeding humanitarian assistance and other non-lethal support uh, to Ukraine. But as allies and on a bilateral basis, we've been providing the sorts of lethal assistance to the Ukrainian armed forces that's been ensuring that the, that the Ukrainian resistance has the equipment that they need to continue prosecuting the fight. In the United States, for our part, uh, since, the, since the start of this conflict, we provided over $7 billion worth of equipment to Ukraine, uh, which includes a whole raft of, uh, of equipment, uh, air defenses, including manned portable air defenses, anti-tank systems, uh, unmanned air systems, armor, artillery, including cannon and uh, HIMARS, which is the uh, advanced uh, rockets, uh, as well as uh, essential communication equipment that's enabling the Ukrainian forces to be able to better communicate, enhancing their survivability and, mo and, and mobility. We've also been coordinating other responses, uh, leveraging NATO's, uh, uh, it, it, the ability of NATO to serve as an essential forum for coordination dialogue uh, and sharing of information on all matters related to security. We've used NATO as a forum to talk about how we can coordinate uh, the imposition of sanctions, which are a national function and an EU function. But we've been able to talk about how we can coordinate that to ensure uh, that Moscow pays a steep price uh, for its invasion. Uh, and lastly, we've also been watching uh, very carefully uh, China and Russia and the uh, growing China-Russia nexus. Uh, you know, we saw the joint statement in the lead up uh, to the invasion where China talked about opposing uh, NATO expansion. Uh, this was one of the first times we also saw it as being significant. It demonstrates a progressively deepening strategic partnership between Russia and China, which is something we should all uh, be mindful of. It also demonstrates that China's self-described image as a guardian of sovereignty and territorial integrity rings rather hollow. Uh, and we also have witnessed China's amplification of Russian disinformation, which certainly should give all of us further cause uh, for concern. But quite frankly, that was just the significant part of the Madrid summit. Um, in terms of the historical, uh, as the ambassador mentioned in her opening remarks, uh, we now have a new strategic concept, which is the first uh, uh, strategic concept we've had since 2010. This is a pretty important document in that it reaffirms that NATO's key purpose is to ensure collective, collective defense of all allies. And it reaffirms that the three core tasks uh, of the alliance, including deterrence and defense, crisis prevention, and cooperative security, do remain the stars that we steer by uh, as an alliance. It recognizes the role of cyber and space as domains that must feature in all of our security planning across the entire spectrum of conflict, from peacetime, crisis, and the conflict or wartime. It also considers the role of hybrid warfare uh, as, uh, as a, a growing characteristic of, of modern combat. I mean, we saw it uh, post-2014. We see it today uh, in Ukraine. We've seen it uh, with Belarus. We also see it with China. Uh, we see it elsewhere. And this is something that we're going to have to deal with uh, going forward. It also describes the promise and the peril in emerging and disruptive technologies. And through the Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, or DIANA, uh, it seeks to put NATO on a path to continue leading in defense transformation for years to come. The strategic concept also talks about uh, the impact of climate change on security for all of us, and it lays out a very ambitious agenda for human security, including women, peace, and security, which is something that we are seeing every day in Ukraine as being absolutely essential. And I wouldn't limit it to Ukraine, but this is something that's brought into our, uh, into our living rooms every day. Uh, in contrast to 2010, when Russia was seen as a potential partner, as the ambassador noted, the new strategic concept captures the threat that Russia poses not only to the Euro-Atlantic area and beyond. It also notes that China's ambitions and coercive policy challenge our interest, security, and values. And this is the first time that we have uh, included China uh, and we've seen China as a feature in the strategic concept, which means fundamentally the important thing is that this means that this is now a concern for all of the allies uh, in NATO. 
And as Secretary Blinken said at the close of the summit, we're not looking for conflict here, but we're trying to make sure that together we're upholding the rules-based international order wherever it's being challenged. And if it's China that's challenging it one way or another, then we'll stand up to that. You see, we've tended to look at security through different regional silos, which I think this strategic concept recognizes that we now have to break down. Because virtually all of these problems touch on all of us and there are different competencies and different perspectives and different assets that countries need to bring to bear. It really shows that together we have to work on these uh, because together we can prevail. Uh, also at the summit, we uh, unfolded a new uh, force model and a new structure, which continues to drive the types of uh, deterrence and defense adaptations that enable us to be able to respond so swiftly to the launch of the crisis. And we're going to continue forward uh, in terms of implementing the new force posture and additional planning uh, associated. So we continue driving this deterrence and defense agenda kind of going forward. As I noted that the, the leaders in Madrid endorsed a new uh, posture, which uh, includes the new, uh, the eight battle groups that I mentioned before. And what this ensures is that there's a strong defense across all domains that's scalable, flexible, and adaptable from the Baltics to the Black Sea and across the entirety of the 360 degrees of our area of responsibility. In terms of defense investment at Madrid, NATO uh, allies made the pledge uh, to, to meet 2% uh, of uh, defense spending, uh, which a majority now have plans to reach it uh, by 2024, which is, uh, which is pretty important. This is a continuation of a commitment we all made in 2014 at Wales. Uh, but I would also note that most uh, allies now see 2% as a floor rather than a ceiling, meaning a baseline and a target. In fact, since 2014, uh, as the Secretary General is very proud to point out, we've seen $350 billion uh, worth of uh, new non-US allied spending on defense. I think this demonstrates the commitment in capitals uh, to, to really resource uh, European security. Uh, allies also agreed to increase significantly common funding, which is important if we're gonna be able to meet the ambitious agenda that we set for ourselves in 2030. Again, all this was uh, truly historic, uh, but I also mentioned that the summit was transformational, which means all of the above. Uh, and, and the fact that we also had agreement to begin the accession process for Finland and Sweden uh, to join the alliance. Now, Finland and Sweden are both strong democracies with highly capable militaries. And we think their membership will strengthen NATO's collective security and benefit the entire transatlantic alliance. And when you think of just how fundamentally transformational this is, you know, Sweden would pride itself on 200 years of military non-alignment, but they had decided that given the security environment, that their security is best met by joining this alliance, Finland as well. Uh, recognizing that their security and the collective security of Europe is best met by them being inside the alliance is truly transformational. And then for the first time, we had participation of Japan, uh, the Republic of Korea, Australia, and New Zealand at the head of state and government level, which underscored the growing linkages between the transatlantic and the Indo-Pacific and the common stakes that we all have in the rules-based international order and how we can move forward in implementing a shared agenda for security. And I would note uh, with great sadness uh, that we lost a leader in driving those linkages uh, with the assassination of former Japanese Prime Minister Abe uh, this morning. Uh, in sum, I would note uh, that the Madrid summit was a great success. And from a US perspective, we demonstrated our unwavering commitment to the transatlantic bond and to NATO's Article 5 commitment. That an attack on one is an attack on all. And it provided an opportunity to advance collective efforts with allies and partners from across Europe and across Asia to strengthen the rules-based international order. And so with that, I'll pause. Uh, and I'd be happy to take some questions uh, from, from the audience here.